is up y'all welcome back today we're talking about eyeshadow in fact we're going to be talking about five tips sneaky things that i feel like have really changed my eyeshadow game over the years that i've either collected from here and there or figured out on my own i don't know if y'all watch hannah hannah louise poston as well as my channel but recently she did a video where she just kind of mentioned the phenomenon of feeling like sometimes we take on a tone in a video of being an authority on something. And I have shied away from that tone in a lot of videos of being like, I know everything about this topic and that's why I'm going to share it with you because I'm the authority on it. And for that reason, you pretty much never see me on my channel doing a like, here's all the things you're doing wrong about your makeup kind of video. Like I used to have a piece of art behind me in my backdrop that said there are no no rules. It's like a David Strakely print. And that's exactly how I feel about makeup. I will never intentionally tell you that you're doing your makeup wrong. These are practical tips that I have collected now over five and a half years on YouTube, being both a creator and a consumer of a lot of makeup content that have helped me eliminate a lot of frustration in my routine and achieve what I'm going for and understand why I'm not achieving what I'm going for sometimes. These are just practical tips that you can take or leave. So let's go ahead and jump in. I thought that my glasses would like help, but they're really like making it feel like I have a screen between you and I, which I, we do, but I don't need an, an extra one. Tip number one, y'all. This is mainly me talking to past me, right? When I rewatch, God help me, if I ever rewatch any of my very old videos that are probably private by now, I wanna just like tap on the screen and be like, khaki, use more than one brush and use a smaller brush. So when I was first getting into makeup, watching YouTube content, watching people like Jaclyn Hill, this was the kind of the shape of brush that I saw everyone using. To me, this is a default brush, right? It's just like a fluffy transition shade brush, if we still talk about transition shades on beauty YouTube. I don't know if we do, but this is a BK201. It's a very good basic brush to distribute eyeshadow in a way that is not gonna look really patchy. It's gonna blend really nicely. And what I would tend to do back in the day was get my transition shade on and then just kind of figure that keeping the same brush and dipping it into the next color and doing my whole eye look, as it turned out that way, was fine. You know, what would be really the difference? Turns out there's a pretty big difference, <laughs> especially as I've gotten older and I'm trying to achieve more specific kind of looks, you know? it's not just about things being blurred and blended. I need I need to know that the eyeshadow is going to be in certain places and very specifically not be in other places. <laughs> For me especially like underneath my eyes or as the eyeshadow can tend to kind of like dip a little bit low on one side if you're using too big of a brush and that is kind of what you'll see in the demo. It's not that it looks terrible, it's just that by virtue of the fact that it is kind of a blunt instrument for certain parts of your eye, you do lose out on some precision. And so I thought I would just do like a quick little primer on like the reasons that brushes are different shapes and sizes, if that's helpful for y'all. So yeah, I mean, anything that's gonna have this like longer bristle and dome shape. So this is the 211, the smaller one here, and the 201 from BK. They're going to do a great job of feathering the edges of an eyeshadow. And that's something that's important with mattes, but also could be with satins and shimmers. And I will say there are natural fiber brushes and there are synthetic fiber brushes a lot if not all of mine are synthetic fiber brushes and they don't pick up quite as much product as a natural fiber brush. And they do tend to diffuse the product a little bit more, whereas a natural fiber brush is going to distribute the product just a little bit more like concentrated. It just holds more product and lets go of it more easily. So it's just a difference. It's a preference thing. And honestly, it can really change the way that you interact with certain formulas, you know, in your collection, just switching between a synthetic or a natural bristle brush. And I will say that the one exception, another kind of diversion here, is the Singe Beauty brush by my friend Angie, they really behave like natural bristle brushes, but they are synthetic, they are vegan. So these are remarkable. Aside from, you know, your kind of fluffy domed brushes, you start to get into the ones that get a little shorter and wider, right? And so anything that has kind of this like flat profile to it, is going to be more of like a placement oriented brush. It's kind of think of it like your finger, you know what I mean? It's just going to be something that flatly holds product like this, and then you can place it, kind of stamp it. But the longer the bristles are, that is going to allow you to uh, blend and kind of buff it and get it to soften. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. I like using a brush like this. This is the 203. I like to use this for like cream shadows once I've laid them down. And it's just really good at kind of the happy medium between control and 
a nice diffused edge. And then you end up with some that are like more about precision, right? So this is the Pro Shadow 18 from Sephora, not an expensive brush. And it's gonna have that dome, but it's round and small and shorter, and it's going to be able to like pick up a good amount of product, but also keep it in a concentrated area. It's not quite a pencil brush, but it's just kind of a fluffy domed brush. Like it's very, very precise, but also fluffy. And then you have kind of, a, I don't know what happened to this, like how something would incur a specific dent like that, but this brush still remains usable. And this is the 204 from BK, and you can see it's like, still got that dome shape and it's just real stumpy, you know? And that's going to allow you to get like underneath your eyelash line and things like that. And it's gonna be really precise and it's gonna control the product a lot better. The reason that I mention all of these things is again, it's not so much that like the eye look I end up with is awful. <laughs> like, and that a blended eye look, a completely blended eye look is awful. It's about two things. One, again, like the precision of getting it where you want it, but the second thing is actually something that I had to apply to like my entire makeup look over time was just having the discipline to switch brushes for different parts of my face, switch brushes for different parts of my eye look. Because what you'll do, even if you have one of those like color switch things that, you know, knocks the shadow off so you can use the brush for another shade, is that you end up with kind of one even coat of dimension and it will all kind of just blend together into one melange. In my case, it meant that I wasn't achieving the illusion that I was going for because my mind does work very much in like the art degree cosmetology. That's I, My background is in art and cosmetology. You know, I think in shadow and light and illusions and things like that. And so that's what I'm trying to achieve on my eyes. And when you're working with a very blunt instrument, not only does it just kind of blend everything together, but also as you're aging, I'm sure a lot of y'all understand this, you have this part of your eye that just sheds product. It just drives me crazy. I remember working with like a Natasha Denona palette way back in the day and oh boy, that is a formula that will show your weaknesses if you have them, oh my gosh. So I remember I was just sitting there just like trying to poke it into a spot with a brush like this and it just wouldn't stick and I was like, what's going on? That's where the necessity comes in for different sizes and shapes of brushes because it does require more precision application. It requires more of a placement because that part of your eye, it just tends to kind of move around. It's sort of this like eye of the storm, right? When you're blending and it just doesn't actually grab any product on a brush like this. And you don't need to spend a fortune on brushes. BK brushes are not super inexpensive. Like they're nice synthetic brushes, but you can get nice synthetic brushes. You know, Real Techniques makes some good ones. There's, I mean, Ulta has a bunch that are really great. Sephora has, you know, their collection that I think are really pretty affordable. And then also I have 10% off at BK and that's down below in every video. And then Singe Beauty, these are not expensive brushes either. So I will link all of those below. All right, two. And if you're not new here, then this is going to be like, you know, if I hadn't mentioned this, you would have been like, Kaki, you know, where was the main point of the video? Learn the basics, the general overview basics of color theory. It's gonna help you so much. So in the demo, you see, I start with my bronzer kind of as my transition shade. So that's already a color that's existing on my makeup look at the time, right? And that's something that we're going to talk about over and over again in this video is color relative to the other colors that are there. And so the main tenet that I tend to focus on on my channel as far as color theory or art math as I tend to call it is temperature. So a cool tone being something that recedes from the eye and a warm tone appearing to be something that looks like it's coming towards you. But that is all relative to what it's next to. So, you know, your complexion or the makeup Makeup that's around it, the eyeshadow that's around it, what have you. It doesn't have to be blue to be a cool tone. It can be a grayer brown than a redder brown. And that saturated brown you'll see in the demonstration, it doesn't look bad. It just doesn't drive home the illusion in a way that the eye believes as much as the more gray toned contour that I used that does accentuate and exaggerate the shadow in the crease of my eye. And it allows me to take some liberties in creating a little bit more shadow. That's gonna make my eyes look a little bit wider set and a little bit bigger. And that's kind of always what I'm doing. And so 
So when you use something like that, especially if it's a mat, that's why there are these, you know, polarized <laughs> groups on the internet who are either like team shimmer in the crease or team no shimmer in the crease. That's the other part of, I feel like, art math that is important to just kind of know. You don't have to obey it all the time, but it's cool to know it. It's just that anything that's matte is going to absorb light. And so it's going to look more naturally like a shadow and it's going to look more like the color that it is because it doesn't have the sensitivity of light reacting to it from every angle depending on where you are kind of thing. And a shimmer by, you know, being on the other end of the spectrum is going to make something look just more noticeable to the eye because it's just grabbing the light. You know what I mean? It's reflecting the light. And so that is another tool you can use to manipulate to create more illusion. So the other thing that's kind of encapsulated in this is, especially when we're talking about kind of beginners in makeup in general or beginners in eyeshadow, don't feel like you need to go out and buy a neutrals palette if you don't have one. If you have a bronzer, a contour, and your setting powder, those are already colors that are native to your skin tone that you feel comfortable wearing on the rest of your face ostensibly that are going to function really well and in a very forgiving way in an eye look because they are lower pigment and they are already living in another place in in your makeup look so they're going to automatically look like they belong with the look and so you can use the warmth of your bronzer and the coolness of your contour to create a little bit of like push pull in the temperature area and then you can also always use a translucent powder or a skin tone kind of loose powder to clean up and re-highlight areas that you feel like you might have lost some of the light so the entire kind of overarching theory of color theory right is being able to have enough of a grasp on the colors that you're using that your eye begins to kind of recognize what's going to push and pull on the appearance of something. It's like, you know, using a contrast bar when you're adjusting a photo in like, you know, a photo editing tool or something, Canva or something. You know, you can like exaggerate the contrast. When you're exaggerating the contrast, you're just brightening the whites and you're deepening the darks. And so that's how you can turn up or turn down, you usually turn up because there's not a lot of uh, turning down on an eye look. It's kind of once it's there, it's there. But that's how you can manipulate the, you know, exaggerated quality of an eye look is like taking something and saying, okay, if I want more drama, the next logical step is find the highest concentration in the eye look that already is deep and deep in the center of it because that's going to trick the eye into thinking that that's an even deeper shadow. You don't have to add black, you know what I mean? To like the whole look, you don't have to just completely revamp the entire eye look or end up with more product on than you meant to. You can use just one maneuver to kind of push the depth and you can use something very bright as a highlight to create contrast that by contrast makes the shadows look deeper. And so, that's kind of the basic understanding of color theory. Like, again, take it or leave it. I just think that it is a really cool thing to have like just in the back of your brain so that you feel like if you want to use it, you can. <laughs> All right. The next one, well, the next two actually, are tips that I have picked up from other people that I think very highly of on the internet. So the first one is from Miss Lisa J, Lisa J Makeup here on YouTube and on Instagram. And she is also the founder of BK Beauty. I have met her in person and let me tell you, her makeup and her entire being are just as flawless in person as they are online. I mean, she really knows what she's doing. And so I watched one of her like quick tip videos. This was years ago, this was before BK or anything, I'm pretty sure. I, I don't know. This is just when I was like, you know, just a consumer of her makeup content. And she talked about this makeup artist trick, right? Of when you are about to apply a matte shadow that scares the crap out of you because it's really high contrast, mix it with a little bit of a satin to break up the formula and use it as kind of a mixing medium to get it to go on and feather more easily. And in the demo, you'll see on one eye, I apply just the matte. And then on the other eye, I actually mix it with this satin that's next to it. And the two big differences there are A, yes, you get a better blend on the eye with the satin mixed in, but the other one, you find that once you lay down that matte and you're using a fluffy brush like this that is, you know, very known to create a really nice gradual gradient into the rest of your skin, what tends to happen is it just kind of stops. The eyeshadow just goes, 
and that's it, you know? And it's just not going to spread further depending on the formula. Some formulas will, some formulas won't, but this one just stopped. And that could have been alleviated by using the satin as a mixing medium to begin with, but also it's really hard to fix after the fact. When I got done filming the inserts, I had to just wipe this eye off and start over because there was no real fixing it. Once you've loaded enough product on your eye, it just kind of like stops sticking, you know, and you just end up with like a muddy mess if you wanna put more primer on or something like that. And so it was such a useful tip for me because then once you have created that gradient, you can go in with just the matte and still achieve, like I was saying, you know, deepening the deeps. You can just achieve that nice matte brown or that matte whatever, deep mahogany or black or whatever and you feel a lot more safe doing so because it's more forgiving because you've already created this really nice blended edge and you can just go in and just intensify kind of the focal point of the depth. The next one, this is the other kind of makeup artist tip that I cannot take credit for. This is an Alexandra Anelle tip. So she made a video not that long ago, although what is time, where she demonstrated how to do a completely black smoky eye, like a matte black smoky eye without quote unquote looking like a panda, which yeah, you think about it, you're like, that's probably gonna look like a panda. And the other issue that comes up with using black shadow is that when it mixes with your complexion product, most people don't have the same undertones as a black shadow. So when you're trying to feather a matte black shadow out into your complexion color, it tends to just kind of make gray instead of being bridged by a more natural looking tone. So, Alexandra Nelly's solution to that is blending the edges with bronzer. A, because it's a more native tone to your skin already and it's what's already in your makeup look and it doesn't, it's very undetectable. You know, it's just about using it to just kind of like bridge the gap so you don't end up with like a patchy gray edge. But also bronzer versus a brown eyeshadow or a bronzer colored eyeshadow because it's lower pigment. So it's just not going to show up as this like, you know, ring of another color. It's gonna act as kind of like a skin tone native mixing medium that just makes that transition more gradual. And I tell you what, I use it all the time, even though I'm not doing any like full matte black smoky eye looks, I am often kind of just trying to get as much of a blend on this outer corner as I possibly can because I love to use this real estate that I have in my temples to just kind of lift the eye up a little bit. And the subtlety of being able to use your bronzer to do that, it actually makes it so much less like noticeable that that's what's happening, but it's just kind of a flattering effect. And as soon as your eye starts to recognize that that's a color, that you can use, right, to achieve certain effects, you'll start using your bronzer to blend the shadow that's on your under eyes. You'll start to use it anytime you feel like something's kind of incongruous in this like no man's land between your lid and your brow. You'll just start to think of color in a way that's like thinking of them as colors in your paint palette, thinking of them as formulas that perform a certain way and show up at a certain opacity, and maybe get out of the mindset of this is my contour, this is my bronzer, this is the place that it goes on my face. All right, I do have a bonus tip that like occurred to me while I was actually like filming the inserts, but here is the final tip of the five, right? And this is gonna seem really obvious because people are constantly shaming you about this on the internet, but I'm actually talking about it for a different reason, and that is pay attention to hygiene, brush hygiene, and expiration dates on your eyeshadows. Now, of course, Tati scared the hell out of us, what, last year on the internet when she did that huge declutter and she was like, you need to take your expiration dates more seriously, especially when you have like a heaving self-aware stash like I do, because they'll sneak up on you. And you're not touching every piece of makeup every day and they will sneak up on you. And she got some like horrible eye infection. I can't remember exactly what happened, but it was like she had to go to the hospital or something. Like it was really bad and everybody was like, oh my God, I'm throwing away all my makeup. Like, yeah, she's not always completely like, <laughs> unsensational, but I felt like that was a pretty like practical, unsensational video from her. Either way, yesterday I opened this up and this is a holiday palette from Pat McGrath that I kind of think of as my anti-basics palette. I think of it as my like go-to when the, these colors don't exist anywhere else in my collection. I'm just like, I need a green, you know what I mean? Like I just don't have a lot of that. And I, this time was looking for like the perfect shimmery peach. And I was like, oh, that's so nice. Like, look at this nice shimmery peach. And 
I ended up having to flush my eye with water because I got a little bit of it in my eye and it stung so bad and I am super paranoid because I just healed this like months long like lump that I had in this eye and so I just went and flushed it and like spent the rest of the day with no eye makeup on that eye specifically because I didn't feel like washing my entire face. Again, self-discipline. But I turned it around and I looked at the expiration and it says 12 months and then I thought when did this come out? I'm pretty sure this was holiday 2021. Yeah, so I've had it a lot longer than that and it's expired, okay? And it's just important to be mindful of that and of washing your brushes fairly often because it actually, besides possibly sending you to the hospital, it can really change the way the makeup goes on. You can start to think you're going crazy because you're like, why doesn't this work like it used to? So the thing with the brushes is, right? You're picking up moisture. You're applying powder, sure, but you're picking up moisture either from your complexion products, from the natural oils of your skin, from a primer, from what have you, right? And then you're dipping it back into the shadow, you know, hopefully not hard panning it or whatever. Like that's not really the issue. The issue is that, well, those oils and then those powders start to create let's just call it micro mud. Like it's starting to make clay, right? Because you're mixing liquid and powder and it's making this kind of like, you know, hard clay essentially that even if you can't see it, it's collecting in your brushes. And yeah, that's gross. Yeah, that's gross. But also it's going to make your shadow behave weird. It's going to make your brushes not blend as well. And so I'm not going to sit here and be your mom and tell you, go wash all your brushes. Cause like, I'm not the queen of it either. I have dozens and dozens and dozens of brushes because if I were to have to clean them every time I use them, like my brushes would just always be wet because I do my makeup like multiple times a day, every day, like different parts of my face and washing my face and trying new things and what have you. And so washing my brushes is a bit of an undertaking, but it's something that I have to stay on top of because especially when you're the way that I am where I like to use a lot of different textures, a lot of different finishes and formulas. I like to use a cream shadow and then a powder shadow or I like to use a cream blush and a powder bronzer or whatever. Yeah, you're making a lot of that weird micro mud in your brush bristles. It's just gonna make your makeup misbehave. And so the combination of using shadows that are recent, that have existed in recent history and being mindful of how long you've had something and also being mindful of the hygiene of the brushes is just, the two are going to work hand in hand for several very positive reasons in your life. <laughs> okay, and the this is the bonus step that occurred to me again while I was like already pretty much done doing this makeup look. Like I had already taken this eye off and was, you know, putting it back on and like, you know, finishing touches and everything. And I was like, if I don't say this, people are going to like wonder if I'm okay, you know? And that is, you know, my personal tip, which is the extension of using your bronzer and your contour in your eye look is also throw out some of your blush in your eye look to make everything look like it belongs. I today am wearing a coral blush. I'm wearing shade 30 in the Armani Luminous Silk blush. And when this goes on, in fact, I'm gonna put a little bit more on. Again, I've been out and about, so touching my face and whatnot. The beauty of this, of course, is that it adds this really lovely, like healthy flush to my cheeks. And it's so lovely and sheer, which also does lend itself really nicely to like a, a subtle application, a sneaky application and an eye look. But to take a small brush and just include this a little tiny bit, what it's doing is it's matching the temperature of your eye look to the rest of your face. That's all it's really doing. Like you're not, you can, but you're not taking something really detailed and adding coral specifically into your eye look. It's just about adding a little bit of like a haze of it so that the eye finds the same color family in the whole look. So you don't end up looking like your eyes just kind of don't belong on your face because that's definitely happened to me. So if there's anything that I've identified as like the arc of my learning, right? Of doing this for as long as I have, because it's just been me kind of experimenting and again, like watching other people's content, but I haven't been doing makeup on other people. It's just that the things that I've learned have helped me feel emboldened to actually take more risks because I know how to make things still look more or less intentional and like they belong together because there were so many times where I ended up just kind of at a loss where I was like, don't know my makeup look. And I'm like, and like, those are the fundamentals that I feel like unify my makeup looks in more subtle ways. And see, here I am like talking myself up like I'm some kind of guru. I don't think of myself as a guru. I don't think of myself as a makeup application expert. I really specifically always wanted to be talking about like the performance of the product, but I feel like it is such an extension of what I do to talk about how to get the most 
out of the products that you already have. And in this case, I am not recommending that you go buy anything. I just want y'all to be able to feel empowered to like use what you have and get the most out of them and to be able to like achieve what you see in your mind. That's all I want is for y'all to have fun. I just want y'all to have fun. So I hope this was helpful. If this was fun and y'all like this kind of video, can you let me know? by giving it a thumbs up, like I will know that you want to, you know, tell me in the comments too, but like more tips oriented kind of stuff where I kind of draw on my color theory and things like that. I don't know, let me know. I, just a little bit different today. And uh, yeah, so give it a thumbs up and uh, I will put a video up here that I think y'all are going to like. If you did enjoy this and you are not yet subscribed, subscribe be a cool thing for you to do, you know? It's just a fun place to hang out. And I wanna thank y'all for, for, for watching today. I love you so much. And I'll see you in the next one.